So I'm going to talk about brachytherapy planning and, uh, and quality assurance. I'll start off with planning, and then we'll go into quality assurance. Um, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time, not much, on classical implant systems, and then I'll talk about modern computerized planning. It, we used to do planning for brachytherapy without computers because we didn't have computers, and gradually computers came in, and, but the classical implant systems didn't need computers, so we, so we could do it that way. And they still kind of exist. And then I'm going to look at the most, con the most common clinical applications of brachytherapy today. And then I'll spend some time talking about quality assurance. So let's look at classical implant systems. Well, the most famous is the Manchester system, the so-called Patterson-Parker system. Um, not used very much today, and I'll talk a bit about it. The Quimby system, or sometimes called the Memorial system, because she worked at Memorial Hospital in New York City. And then the Paris system, basically developed in Paris. You, these are all used all over the world. Um, I've never used the Paris system, but many hospitals in the United States. And it depends where the doctor's trained. If the doctor's trained in Paris, they'll use the Paris system. If doctor's trained in Britain, they'll use the Manchester system. Right? <laughs> um, and with the advent of computerized treatment planning, most of this is now gone, except maybe the Manchester system for the treatment of cervix cancer. And I'm sure some of you are still using some of these other systems. But with computerized systems, they've kind of gone away now. Um, and, and we found the computer could do a better job. And it, it, it does a lot of work for us, because I can remember doing planning for brachytherapy. And it would take me all day to do a plan for, for a brachytherapy patient. It was very intensive on, on the work of the physicist to do a good plan. Let's talk then a little bit about the Manchester system. Um, the Manchester system aimed at producing a uniform dose within the treatment volume. You define a treatment volume, you put needles or, or tubes in the patient and try to get as uniform dose distribution as you can. And they had variable strength sources. So they weren't all the same source. You, you could put different strength on the outside than you put on the inside, for instance, to get a fairly uniform dose. And the, there were rules applied to the placement of the sources. So you had rules, you place the sources, the activity of the sources to get as uniform dose distribution as possible. Now we can do all that with a computer, with optimized treatment planning, much easier. And then they produced tables and you could calculate how long to leave the implant in the patient. Most of this, in fact, all of this, pretty much in the old days, was for low-dose rate brachytherapy. We didn't have high-dose rate when most of this was done. It was originally devised for radium, but as I mentioned, radium kind of disappeared. It was too dangerous, too hard to shield, and then it took over with cesium. And you get the same, a, a new table produced with cesium, by the way, um, that I hadn't thought of mentioning it, but the new tables that turn radium into cesium, Bob Shalek, yeah. you remember? Did you know he just died yesterday? No. Bob Shalek, the, the person who did all that work to convert the radium tables into cesium tables, unfortunately passed away yesterday. I just heard it by email this morning. I wasn't planning to mention that, but we should thank him for converting all those tables. He and Marilyn Stovall, did all that work at, uh, at the MD Anderson Hospital. The Quimby system, now we're talking Memorial Hospital in New York, another big center for physics. Um, some of the very early physicists in medicine started at the Memorial Hospital. Edith Quimby was one of those pioneers. Um, she was a lovely lady. You knew Edith Quimby, didn't you? Did you know Edith? See, you... She was... She had already died. Okay. Edith Quimby, when I first knew her... Exactly. Edith Quimby, she was a gray-haired lady, a lot older than I am now. She was probably in her 80s, late 80s. And she would still come to all the, the chapter meetings and sit there and ask questions and, and be available to talk to the younger physicists coming, like me, coming into the field. She was a wonderful lady. I always remember Edith Quimby. She was... I haven't got time to tell you a story about Edith because you, you want to talk next. <laughs> don't want to take your time. It required a uniform distribution of seeds of all the same strength. So you didn't get 
a uniform dose distribution. You got uniform seed distribution, all the same strength. So it was much hotter in the middle than it was on the outside, which may be okay for most cancers, because that's probably where most of the cancer cells are, near the middle of the, the volume that you're treating. So they produced a non-uniform dose distribution. And then again, just the same as Patterson Parker, you've got tables that you could use, and I used to use these tables all the time to, <coughs> to calculate the treatment times and the dose distributions around the sources. They were originally devised for radium and radon seeds, uh, but eventually extended to iridium and I-125. And uh, Lowell Anderson did a lot of work on these, developing nomograms. You could use nomograms instead of tables to do the same thing. I'm not going to show that. But not many people, I think, are using those anymore because everything's computerized. But the nomograms can certainly still be used. Yeah, I used to use them. Paris system, they were designed for iridium wires and extended later to iridium seeds in a strand. So they look like wires in terms of the distribution of the radioactivity. The sources were equidistant apart, arranged in patterns, usually squares or triangles. Um, the dose is called the basal dose. Uh, they had this, which was um, the minimum dose located halfway between the sources in these patterns. So it was kind of a minimum dose in the, in the implant. I never used the Paris system. Do you ever use the Paris? I know of only two places in the USA that used it. Both, they trained in Paris. The doctors changed in Paris, so they want to use the Paris system. But, <laughs> no, they wouldn't let Paris system there. You had the memorial system. And again, you had tables provided to calculate the treatment times and to work out the dose distributions. So let's now talk about, and, and that's the old system of dosimetry. We'll talk a little bit later about more the computerized system of dosimetry. Um, what are the most clinic common clinical applications of brachytherapy today, and I, I haven't got time to do them all, so I'll just pick a few. Gynecological treatments, probably very common around the world. Um, prostate implants, very common around the world, particularly in the United States. And uh, breast implants is getting to be more common around the world now. We do a lot of them in the United States. So I'm going to just talk about those three. So let's talk about gynecological brachytherapy. When is it used? When is brachytherapy used? It's used for treating cervix cancer very extensively. It's used for treating cancer cells that are in and around the vagina. Not necessarily vaginal cancer, but cells that might have spread maybe from the uterus into the vagina. And uh, endometrial cancers. So let me talk about cervix cancers first of all. And these are typical applicators that we used to use. They're now more modern, but the same kind of design. You have these tandems that are pushed into the uterine cavity. And hopefully, nowadays, we've got iridium sources so they can be made a little bit smaller. It used to be quite painful for patients to have these pushed in when we had cesium, for instance, because they were quite big diameter. So these get pushed in, and they have different curvatures depending on the curvature of the uterine canal. They also have these things called ovoids. Ovoids fit into the um, vault of the vagina, and they irradiate the, the um, cervical os and around the, end of, the distal end of the vagina. And then we have these so-called so caps that fit onto those. Why do you want caps to fit onto those? You want to use the biggest spacing you can away from the tissues to get the best dose distribution. Remember, distance gives the further the distance, the better the dose distribution, the better the penetration you get into the tissues. So you put the biggest caps on that would comfortably fit into the patient's vagina. And these are modern versions of the same thing. These are just the same thing. And you'll notice that the, uh, the, the latest ones are CT and MR compatible. They don't have steel in them. They're made of CT and MR compatible. And notice also, instead of just the, the uh, ovoids, we now have rings. And a lot of people use, it, use ring applicators. So the ring fits into the end of the, the distal end of the vagina around the, um, the uterine canal sources that go into the urine canal. Um, we found that they were much more easy to input into a patient, and the patient didn't need um, any anesthesia. It wasn't really painful. To put these, the, the um, 
bigger ovoids in could be quite painful. And That's why they designed the Henschke applicator. Right, to fit in, in yeah, this, this, this applicator, it, the Henschke applicator down here at the bottom, that, that fits in a lot easier into, into the patient's vagina. It's not so uncomfortable. When you're doing high-dose rate brachytherapy, the patient's going to be coming in maybe six or seven times. You don't want to have to keep anesthetizing them every time they come in. And that worked very well in, in our hospital. We were the one, one of the ones that started with the... And, and another thing I haven't shown here is we used to put into the uterine canal a, I can't remember, a stent, we called it. Did you use the stent? And that stayed there during the maybe seven or eight treatments the patient was going to get. And, and the sources, would, the, the intrauterine sources would fit in very easily with no pain to the patient at all. So that worked out really well. That came from Schmidt in uh, South Africa. And Felix Schmidt made them, but Schmidt in, Dr. Schmidt is a radiation oncologist. Um, it basically invented them. In fact, while we're talking about inventing, you didn't, if, you didn't need to have a dilation every day. Correct. You didn't need to dilate the uterine canal each time, which is, again, a problem. And, and if you look at this, oh, I'm losing it. If you look at this one, there's, there's kind of a spacer here. This pushes away the rectum from the sources, and that was invented by Jocelyn in Leeds. And you know what he did? He went to the barber shops and got shoehorns that, that you put your shoes on, got shoehorns, and he fitted them on and found the best shoehorns, and then he bought up, and they couldn't understand why there were no shoehorns in Leeds in England, because he, he had them all in his hospital. He bought them all up and tried them on, and eventually, and that's what this is. The uh, Nucleotron company then started making them to fit onto their, their applicators. Let's look at uh, the Manchester system, and this is still going on today. We, with the Manchester system, they would calculate the dose at two points, points A and points B, and we still do it today. Even though we have advanced dosimetry systems, we still use points A and B for cervix cancer and maybe endometrial cancer as well. And point A is 2 cm up from the cervical os, which is right down the, the entrance point to the cervical canal there, 2 cm up from there and 2 cm across. And we all use that, rightly or wrongly, to represent the tumor dose. You can't have a tumor dose because this is a three-dimensional object, but that's what we represent, or certainly the prescription dose. And we all think of it as the tumor dose. And then they have this other point, B, further out over here, five centimeters out from the center, and that kind, Manchester had a reason for that point, but we kind of always thought of that as being the normal tissue dose. You're outside the tumor now, and that's where some normal tissues are. Okay? Well, that's easy, except most patients aren't designed like that. Most patients have a tilt to their um, uterine canal, their uterus, particularly if there's cancer in it. Cancer's pushing it off to one side. So most patients aren't really like that. And so what you do is you measure 2 cm up along the tandem and then 2 cm at right angles to the tandem to represent point A, if you like, the tumor dose. Because the tumor moves, the tumor moves, the area you want to treat, the target volume moves as the uterus moves. So that's why point A moves with the uterus, whereas point B represents a, the anatomy of the patient, the pelvis of the patient. So point B stays the same. Point B, you move straight up along the axis of the patient and 5 cm out. So that's often an exam question. We had that so many times in our exam. I should put it in an exam. I haven't got it. I didn't put it in. I should have done. You already gave the answer, didn't you? Right. I gave, well, no. Sort of, all the answers in the test that you're, did you all know you're going to have a test? You're all going to have a test. All the answers in the test we've already talked about. <laughs> so the, the, you can read that. I don't intend you to read it. Uh, these are some recommended doses for low dose rate brachytherapy for cervix cancer. And all I want you to see is that as the tumor stage goes up, as the tumor stage goes up, the amount of external whole pelvis dose goes up. Why? Because now you expect that some of the cells the cancer cells might have got into the rest of the pelvis. So you treat the whole pelvis, and the higher the stage of the disease, the more pelvis you treat. 
When you're doing that, you can't keep giving the same amount of dose to the intracavitary. You're going to have to reduce the intracavitary dose. So the intracavitary doses decrease somewhat. The total dose actually increases because now you've got more advanced disease, you need more dose. So that's how that works. And the same thing applies to high dose rate. This is an example for early stage disease. Um, probably you don't need as much high dose rate, uh, so much external beam, although I noticed this table goes out to 40, 54 gray. I just did some, here it is. It goes all the way out to 50.4 gray. Early stage cervix cancer probably doesn't need that much external beam. You're probably better off treating it mainly with high dose rate. And, and the, the brachytherapy is the most efficient way to deliver radiation. You're putting it inside the cancer. So brachytherapy is a very conformal type of therapy. So the more brachytherapy you can use, the better. So my department would never have treated um, very high doses to the external beam. Oh, this is now advanced disease. I moved on. Advanced disease, now you need the external beam. And so you've got a lot of external beam. And, <coughs> and uh, as you increase the external beam, you decrease the, the dose or the dose per fraction accordingly to get a constant dose. I've got strange things happening here. OK. Now let's talk about irradiating the vagina. <coughs> it can be treated low dose rate. Probably nowadays, mostly, it's treated with high dose rate. Low dose rate's a problem because the patient's lying in bed. The nursing staff has a problem coming in and seeing the patient. Although pulse dose rate is often used here. So I should have said, you can't do it with pulse dose rate. But most times, we use high dose rate for vaginal brachytherapy. It, we usually use a cylindrical applicator of an appropriate diameter, and I'll explain that in a minute, what's appropriate. Okay. Um, and then you have this stepping pattern with a high-dose rate remote afterloader or a pulse-dose rate remote afterloader that can design the dose distribution around it to get a uniform dose distribution in the tissue around the, uh, the vaginal about the vaginal vault. And typically, we define the dose as half a centimeter outside. Okay, remember inverse square law again. So this is what these applicators look like, typically cylinders. And you use the largest diameter applicator that will fit comfortably into the patient's vagina because you want a better dose distribution. You get a better depth dose with a larger applicator. And then finally, endometrial brachytherapy. And this can be treated low dose rate. Again, most commonly nowadays, high dose rate. Um, for patients who have lost their the uterus, so post-hysterectomy patients, we just treat the vagina, the upper end of the vagina, the vaginal cuff. Because maybe before they removed the uterus, some of the cancer cells had gone down into the vaginal walls. Um, for patients who have an intact um, uterus, then we treat both the vagina and the uterine cavity. <clears throat> and this will give you a picture of what we're talking about here. Um, this is a picture of a patient's uterus. This is the uterus here, and this is the vagina down here. And the endometrium is all this tissue surrounding the uterine, uterine cavity, and it, and it can spread down into the vagina. So we want a system that will actually open up in the uterine cavity up here. So this is what the system looked like. What did we used to call this? I, Hensch, not Henschke. What? Said it loudly? No, no. Um, the, the type of applicator that spreads out, what was it called? See, we, we've both forgotten. We, we used to have to do this, and we've yeah. forgotten what it's called now. It's not hench key. Different what? Words. Yeah. Words. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So what happens is you push this in through the, the, the uh, uterine canal, and then you push a little trigger, and the bottom bit opens out to push against the walls so that you can treat the um, vaginal vault, the far end. And uh, I think I've got a picture of the dose distribution. Here's the dose distribution that you'll get from a typical. And you can see the, the, uh, it's spreading out at the, at the far end. So this is the far end. This is the vaginal. This, this is the uh, vault of the, um, of the uterus. And, and you've got these sources spread out here. And typically, we would define the dose two centimeters lateral to the middle of the uterine applicators. 
So that would be a typical point to define. You might want to give 500 centigrade per fraction there or something. That, that would be how you define it. <clears throat> and what are the guidelines? Guidelines published everywhere. I'm just pro quoting American brachytherapy because I can get hold of them very easily. Um, so if you don't add any external beam to these patients, these are the number of high dose rate fractions of different doses that people are using and that the American Brachytherapy Society say are appropriate for, for these patients. Remember, it's half a centimeter uh, away from this center. Uh, sorry, two centimeters. Two centimeters away from the center of the uterine canal in the middle. So these are typical used. So that's gynecological brachytherapy. Very common, I, I would say, one of the most common applications of brachytherapy. Maybe the most common now is prostate, because we found... In the US, at least, in North America. Certainly in the North America, prostate, not as common. correct. So we're, we're now using a lot of prostate cancer, because prostate cancer is very common in North America, pri partly because it's overdiagnosed. And we treat a lot of prostate cancer patients that would never die of prostate cancer because these are usually older gentlemen and they would probably die of old age or heart attack or something before they're... Because prostate cancer is a very slow-growing cancer. But we treat a lot of them because their PSA goes up and, and then they get frightened that they've got cancer, treat me, and they go in for treatment. And one of the most common treatments, uh, prostate cancer, is brachytherapy. So there are two major alternatives uh, of brachytherapy. We can treat with permanent implants, with either iodine or palladium, or we can treat with temporary high-dose rate implants. You can do it high-dose rate, or you can do electronic brachytherapy, which is basically high-dose rate, as we mentioned before. And how do we do it? Well, the most common method is ultrasound-guided transperineal prostate brachytherapy. Sounds very complicated. All you do is you put an ultrasound device into the patient's rectum and you look at the, the ultrasound outline of the prostate at different points in the rectum and then you design your treatment accordingly and put in, to the, you have a template like this that you push up against the perineum of the patient, so it's per, transperineal, you push it up against the perineal, and under ultrasound guidance, you put needles in to where you want these sources to go and drop the sources off if you're doing a permanent implant or leave, or leave the catheters in to, if you're going to do a high-dose rate treatment. And this is what the ultrasound pictures will look like when you get them at different points along the rectum, and you see that. And then you can use this to plan where you put the seeds, you can use it for planning. In fact, here we go. This is used for planning. Um, you can put seeds to get the distribution that you want. You have an optimization program that would do this for you to, to tell you where to drop off. If you're doing a permanent implant, you're going to drop off seeds. They're going to stay there for the rest of the life of the patient. So you just drop them off where the planning system tells you to drop off the seeds. And this is just a, I won't spend a lot of time doing this because we haven't got a lot of time, but basically what we start off with here is we have the ultrasound scan of the prostate, we do the contouring of the prostate, all this in the treatment planning computer, and then you develop a plan, um, you look at the dosimetry, if the dosimetry is what you wanted, okay, if it's not, then you go back and plan again, but let's just say it's okay, and then you record all that data, you kind of have to go in and and implant the seeds with real-time dosimetry. So you can do this real-time or not real-time, but most of the time nowadays it's done real-time. So you have the ultrasound system there in the patient's rectum showing you where you're actually dumping the seeds. So you can see where they go. Okay? Then you review this, see if it's uh, okay. Maybe use some fluoroscopy, see if the seeds are in the, in the right place. If the dosimetry is acceptable, you record all the data and, and then send the patient home because you can't do anything about it now because it, the seeds are there permanently. So it's the way it's done in practice. And medical physicists get involved all the time with this. They're in the room with the patient. One of the few times that the physicist actually gets in with the patient and sees the patient. We did that also with the intravascular brachytherapy. Yes, we used to do intravascular brachytherapy, and the physicist would always have to be there to do it. 
But that's died out because the, the vascular experts have found a better way to treat the patients rather than radiation, so we don't. Anybody doing intravascular, putting radioactive sources into blood vessels to open them up? Nobody does it anymore. But that was so exciting when we first, about 20 years ago. We, well, it is great, very exciting. It's close to 20 years ago because we stopped doing it 15 years ago. I think we pretty much stopped. It lasted for about five years. Right. They, they came up with stents that they could put in that, were, that had a chemotherapy um, on them, and it would, kill the, it, it would open up the blood vessels with chemotherapy rather than with radiation. You know why they stopped it? Because they didn't need the radiation oncologist or the physicist. So in America, that means that they get all the reimbursement. They get all the money from that procedure. They don't have to share it with other people, which is a logistic issue. And cardiologists yeah. and neurosurgeons, which we used to do that because of the brain, yeah. radioactive brain right. implants. Right. They yeah. implants in the brain, really. Yeah. They didn't want anybody to tell them what to do. No. And we were it, there telling them what to do. Well, it was a law in America, in most states, probably all states, that the radiation oncologists had to actually do the procedure. So the reimbursement for, for them was great because that's all they did. They didn't have to worry about the patient from then on. They, for the, their doctor, their vascular doctor, looked after the patient, which is kind of nice. Okay, let's talk about prostate permanent implants with I-125, half-life of 60 days. The dose is delivered over many months. Well, the dose is delivered over the lifetime of the source, which is forever, a little bit forever, because it's exponential. But the, the useful dose is delivered over many months. With palladium, the useful dose is delivered over many weeks. So in theory, if you have a more rapidly growing prostate cancer, you would use palladium, Slower growing, most of them are slower growing, use I-125. Um, the total dose to delivered to infinity is very simple. It's the initial dose rate times the mean life. Makes life very easy for a physicist to calculate the dose. But it gets very complicated when you've got a tumor that's repopulating while you're treating it, because then you have to calculate what the effective dose is. Okay. So examples, if the initial dose rate of I-125 is 7 centigrade per hour, then the total dose is initial dose rate times the mean life is 145 gray, which is what we mentioned before, is what we now use. And the same thing with palladium. The initial dose rate is 21 centigrade per hour. You get about 123 gray. For, <coughs> and when prostate, when, when prostate cancer treatments first began with palladium, nobody knew what dose to give. I calculated it with the linear quadratic model and came up with exactly the dose that we give today. So the LQ model sometimes works really well. And it's still used today, right? And then these are some recommendations. Let's not go over them in detail of what kind of doses to give if you're just giving um, the seeds or if you're combining seeds with ex some external beam radiation. You won't use external beam radiation at all unless you think that the cancer spread outside the prostate. If you think it's spread outside the prostate, they need some external beam too, because you're only putting the seeds into the prostate. They won't irradiate anything outside. <clears throat> so HDR for monotherapy, there are a variety of different fractionation schemes that you could use, and the American Brachytherapy has published these in case people don't know what to use, and they haven't done much um, HDR therapy for prostate cancer, then they can use these, um, these doses. <coughs> so uh, <coughs> this is the, a task group of the American Brachytherapy Society. He said, what do you do if you're going to have to give some external beam because of the uh, spread outside of the, the prostate? And these are some of the numbers that they give you depending on what external beam that you've had. So I'll just show you that, that. These are all published. You can find them. And you don't even need to know. That's the physician that is going to prescribe these doses. They need to know this. They need to know where to get this information. And I'm sure other organizations, uh, Europeans, have different publications to do this. Now I'm going to talk uh, about accelerated partial breast irradiation, APBI as we call it in the United States. 
It's brachytherapy for breast cancer, and it's used after a lumpectomy. Now we've discovered that we don't need to irradiate the whole breast in probably the majority of breast cancer patients. Just take out the tumor, and it leaves a cavity inside, and treat the walls of the cavity in case the surgeons left some cancer cells in the walls of the cavity. Now, the two major techniques one is to put needles in, and I'll show you that, interstitial brachytherapy. Or the other is to put a special applicator that actually makes the cavity into roughly spherical shape, which is very convenient in terms of dosimetry, because if it's roughly a spherical shape and you put a source in the middle, you pretty much get a spherical dose distribution. And so the dose distribution in the cavity is pretty much uniform around. So very interesting, and I don't know how wide that spread this is outside of the USA. We use it a lot in the USA. Balloons. Balloons. Well, I'm going to show you some examples. So let's look at the technique for interstitial, and this is just one example. You have a template that you attach to the breast and compress the breast, and then you you put the needles in through that template. must be very painful for the patient. Presumably they get enough sedation. I, well, no, we do it in the transperineum. Come on, we with yeah, prostate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can see the distribution of the, uh, of the needles in, in here. And then you, if you're doing high dose rate, for instance, it would be easy to optimize the dose distribution to irradiate around the cavity. Here, the cavity is an irregular shape. You haven't made the cavity into a sphere here, so it's an irregular shape. Yes. This is Bob Kuski in Wisconsin. Um, he used to be in uh, New Orleans. That's when I first knew him. And he, he invented this method and took it with him to Wisconsin. Actually, my son's a medical physicist, used to work with him. And uh, he was very unhappy when my son left because he was the one physicist that really understood this method. He worked with him a lot. So this is what it looks like when you've finished putting the needles into the patient. Look how they've, do, they've shaped it around the cavity. Your right-hand diagram there, they've shaped it around the cavity so that you get a fairly uniform distribution around the cavity. And then you do this high dose rate with maybe um, five fractions in a week, something like that. And the American Brachytherapist Society, again, has come up with some um, examples. Now, the, the balloon method that uh, Yakov was discussing is, is relatively new, probably the last six or seven years. And you, you, at the time of surgery, when the patients just had the lump removed, you insert a deflated balloon into the cavity. Then you stitch the patient up, and a week later, the patient comes back after the wound has started to heal. The patient comes back, and then you inflate the balloon. And then that makes the cavity nice and spherical, so you can treat it. And this is the mammocyte system. Used to just be one source, or done high dose rate. Used to be just one source position in the middle, and then they've changed it now, and you've got various, uh, various um, in catheters that spread out inside there. Um, and, and it's very similar, actually, to this system, which is called the contour system, which has four different catheters that are spread out inside the balloon and a central one. And you can get a dose distribution that you, you design for that cavity. It's not quite spherical, but you can get it spherical. Right. So the contour displaces the shape of the tissue, more, more or less spherical. doesn't have to be spherical because you can do optimization of the dose distribution. You've got lots of potential source positions. And there's another method called the SAVI that doesn't use a balloon, but uses this system that you can expand inside the cavity. You expand it, and it pushes the cavity out to be roughly, um, roughly spherical again. And, get it. and again, it doesn't have to be exactly spherical because you have different source positions. You can, at, you can optimize the dose distribution very easily. And then finally is another one that I haven't actually used called the clear path. And uh, it's very similar to that. Again, it's something you can expand inside to create something that looks like a cylinder, a, a, a spherical system. And you've got this little pink thing there which actually protects the tubes when the patient, because this is going to be probably a week's treatment, um, 
come in once a day for a, for a treatment. You want to protect it, and it, it, it's not so ugly because it kind of covers up the, the uh, tubes that are in the patient. But that's about all that's for. How thick is the diameter of the incision? Yeah, this looks like a big incision. As I say, I haven't got any experience of using that because that's a. But remember, this is all done in surgery. This is when the patient's having surgery. You insert it, and then you wait a week, and and eventually, when it's taken out, the the doctor will stitch it back up again. So you've got, you haven't got a hole left in the patient. <coughs> um, typical doses that are used. Um, typically, if you do it low dose rate, not many people are doing it low dose rate, but you can. Uh, and high dose rate, the, everybody almost in the United States is using 34 gray, one centimeter outside the cavity. Okay? Think about it. That means closer to the cavity wall, you're giving a much higher dose, maybe as high as 50 or 60 gray closer. And that's very clever because you expect the higher density of cancer cells to be closer to the cavity because that's where they might have been left by the surgeon. So it's very clever that you actually have this dose distribution. And it works very well. This is they're doing really well. So I'm going to finish very little on quality assurance because some of you are coming to the um, demonstration this afternoon. We do quite a bit of quality assurance in the demonstration this afternoon. So it's needed to ensure the safety of the patient, the public, and the staff. Positional accuracy of the sources, temporal accuracy, so they've got to be in place for a certain time, temporal accuracy of the sources, and then dose delivery accuracy in, in general. So <clears throat> the, there are guidelines to do this. ESTRO has some guidelines. You can find these free online. Similarly, AAPM has a task group report, and you can get all those online. And they, they look at daily, quarterly, and so on, quality assurance. Safety of the public and staff, your talk next. I should stop now because <laughs> error avoidance, very important to avoid errors. It's easy to make errors in brachytherapy. As you didn't present any of that, but a lot of big errors have been made in brachytherapy. Patients have actually died because they left the source in the patient and sent the patient home. Bad news. Um, clear prescriptions, and you've heard all about this for external beam. The same thing applies to brachytherapy. Emergency, got to have emergency procedures to make sure you know what to do if the source gets stuck, which it does. I usually send in my junior staff into the room to get the source out of the patient because I don't want to do it. <laughs> he's quicker than me, too. So. <laughs> and he's got longer arms. Gary is L. He has very long arms, so he can reach. <laughs> Because you can, there's a lot of radiation there with a high dose rate source. You have to do it fast. And you have to train the staff to do it. That's very important. Radiation safety in general, room shielding, and so on. Um, positional accuracy, you've got to make sure that the program, that the machine is programmed properly, and you've got to check it, that the, that the, the sources go to the right place. Lots of systems for doing that. The catheters are all the correct lengths. There have been errors made because of that. Um, and then all the appliques and so on are in, in the correct place. And, uh, and, and you have to do this per patient, not just per week or per day. You have to do it for every patient. And make sure that each patient gets the right treatment that you're planning. And there's a, a, a tool for doing this. I think you've probably seen one like this this afternoon. Those of you who go over to the hospital, very similar to this, where using gaff chromic film, for instance, you can see where the source stopped. And you know where you meant it to stop. And you can check, is it within a millimeter of where you meant it to go? The same thing with time, low dose rate. And this is important. Make sure that you take the sources out if you're doing low dose rate when they're supposed to be taken out. You don't leave them in the patient for an extra day or two because you forgot to tell somebody to take them out. Um, we did that once. Um, <clears throat> and I had to go in and take them out myself instead of the doctor because the doctor was on vacation and he forgot. So I had to do it. That doesn't happen very often. Fortunately, I had good records. <laughs> um, remote afterloading, um, <clears throat> everything has to, be has to be checked with the quality assurance program. Um, transit dose is the dose that the patient gets as the source is moving in the patient. Not when it's stationary, when the source stops, but when it's moving to the stop positions. There's some dose, and we need to know what that is. It's an added dose to the patients. 
and then accurate transfer of the data from the treatment planning computer. And in dose delivery as accuracy, physical aspects, make sure everything's right, we've got the right source strength for that particular patient, and all the data's in there. And, uh, and if you're taking account of the, the attenuation in the applicators, that should all be in there. It should be part of your quality insurance program. And then clinical aspects, every patient, you, you've got to know how accurate that data is. You, if you're using imaging data and you're transferring it to the treatment planning computer, make sure that it's all right. And then <clears throat> source strength calibration, I already talked about source strength. Primary stand, standards lab or a secondary standards lab has the ability to do this accurately. You don't, in your department, they do it, and then they calibrate your equipment that you're using to do it. So typically, um, this is done by the primary lab, and then you have dosimeters like these um, well-type ionization chambers that you can put the sources in. They have been calibrated by the standards lab to represent the dose that they measure, equivalent to measuring at one meter from the source to get the, the source strength. And these are just three of the uh, <coughs> chambers. I don't know what one. I'm sure you're going to see one this afternoon if you come to the demonstration. The calibration lab surprise you with lots of data. And I'll just show you one of them, the sweet spot localization, location. Um, in, inside your, your chamber, there's a sweet spot, a spot where it doesn't change much with position, which is where you want to work, and they'll tell you about that, and you should measure that too, moving your source in and out until you get the maximum, and that's where it's more like you've got less error in, in positioning. And then for each patient, um, you need to check everything, make sure you've got the right patient, as we heard before. Um, everything has to be as it was prescribed. So the patient gets the right dose, everything that you check. You need double check by an independent expert. And if you can, do a manual check. And I mentioned how you might do that at one point, just to manually check that it's giving you the, the, uh, the right information for that patient. And then make sure everything gets signed at the end. Uh, we have to do that in the United States because it's a law. I don't know about other countries. But we always make sure everything's signed. The other reason we make sure everything's signed is... You can't get reimbursed unless you've signed it. You, the law in the United States is you didn't do it unless you signed it. So they apply for reimbursement, and, and if they get reimbursed, then that's against the law, and then they get into trouble. And this has been happening a lot in the USA. A lot of people, the tax man has been catching up with them for getting reimbursed and then kind of hiding it. Not very good. And then imaging, I won't go into any details, but it... it there are lots of papers on imaging for various reasons. You use imaging for planning. You use imaging for guiding the applications, like we did ultrasound earlier. Um, and then you, you define the final treatment plan using your images. And then finally, you can do some quality assurance using the imaging system that, that you have. So the general flow of a treatment is you prepare the patient. If the patient needs anesthesia, you give them anesthesia. You do some QA on the equipment, make sure it's working right. And, and then you apply it with or without image guidance. Um, you, might do lo you might be localizing while you're doing it. It might be fluoroscopy. It might be ultrasound, for instance. Some people now have CT scans when they can do it while, uh, actively while the patient's being treated. And, uh, <clears throat> and then define the, keep, define the target and the organs at risk with, with the imaging system. Do your planning, validate the plan, make sure it's what you intended to use, and then give the treatment and then document everything. So let me summarize quickly so that you can get on with your talk about how to avoid errors. Um, classical systems are relatively little used today, except maybe the Manchester system for cervix cancer. Um, computerized planning is pretty much taken over. You buy a high dose rate unit, you buy the computerized planning system with it, for instance. And then you, you need a really good QA program to both for the individual patient and for all the patients. So that's got to be done regularly by the physicist. And we have daily checks, monthly checks, checks per patient, annual checks on the plans. And this is all published by ESTRO and published by the AAPM.